Namaste and a very, very good evening to all of you. I welcome you to my channel, The Outlier. My name is Mithun. In today's video, I'll be talking about principal component analysis. We'll be looking at how to perform principal component analysis using RStudio. Even before I get started with principal component analysis, may I request you to subscribe to my channel, also like and share my videos. Firstly, what exactly do we mean by principal component analysis? Principal component analysis is a dimension reduction technique. Imagine that you have a large data set with too many variables. It becomes very, very difficult to process a data set which has 60 or 70 variables. Instead of working with 60 to 70 variables, we can reduce the size of the variables and represent the same in a smaller dimension so that we can understand the underlying structure in a better way. So principal component analysis is a dimension reduction technique. It is an unsupervised learning technique, meaning there is no dependent variable here. We just have a set of variables in PCA. Thirdly, principal component analysis is widely used to study the underlying structure in the data set. Last but not the least, when there is high relationship between the variables, principal component analysis method can be used to reduce the correlation and to obtain orthogonal or independent factors. So without spending too much time on theory, let us quickly understand PCA with the help of a data set. Let me begin by importing a data set. I will be using a data set which is called as IRIS data set. Let me view this particular data. As you can see here, this is the data set that we have. There are 150 records. There are six columns. The first column is ID. We have flower characteristics like sepal length, sepal width, petal length, and petal width. Further, we have the species of flower. There are three different species of flowers here. The first species is Setosa. Further, you have the second species, which is called as Versicolor. And lastly, you have Virginica. These are the three species of flower. When we run the PCA, we will be dropping the last variable species. Also, we will be running, we will be dropping the ID variable. We are going to execute the PCA with only the flower characteristics like sepal length, sepal width, petal length, and petal width. Let me close this particular file and make a move on to the next command. What is the next command? In the next command, what we will be doing is we will be studying the structure of the data set. All this is part of what is called as data inspection. So in line number five, I will be inspecting the data. So this is the command that we will be executing structure of data. The moment I type structure of data set, what R does is it gives you the sample size in the data set, which is 150. There are six variables. These are the names of variables which you already have seen, ID, sepal length, sepal width, petal length. Further, R also displays the data type of the variable and it gives a preview of 10 different, 10 records. So the first 10 records is what R highlights. In addition to structure, you can also use another command, which is called as summary of data. Now, summary of data is very, very useful because this returns very, very important statistics. This gives you five important statistics like minimum, the first quartile, median, mean, third quartile, as well as maximum for each of the variables. The first point is, let's look at the minimum for sepal length. The minimum value is 4.3. Compare this with the minimum value of sepal width, which is 2. The minimum is very, very different, which means that some of these values will be very low. Others may be very, very high. Let's further go on to look at petal length and petal width. The minimum for petal length begins with 1. For, and for petal width, the minimum value is 0 
Now, there might be a bit of a problem here because the range here is different. Therefore, we need to normalize the data set at a later stage. So normalization is something which is very, very important before you feed the input variables into PCA. So we have done structure as well as summary in data inspection. What is the next step of the analysis? The next step of analysis is to partition the data set. How do we partition the data set? To partition the data set in line number nine, what I'm going to do is I'm going to first of all set the seed. This ensures sample repeatability. And I'm going to use the sample command to create two data sets. The first data set is what is called as the training data set. The second data set is what is called as the testing data set. 80% of the records will be used for training. 20% of the records will be used for testing. I repeat. 80% of the data will be used for training and 20% of the records will be used for testing. So let us go ahead and extract the training sample as well as the testing sample. In line number 15, I will be creating the training data set. In line number 16, I will be creating the testing data set. There is a variable which is called as int int equal to one, wherever there's a value of one that will be pulled and I will be assigning it under training data set and wherever int takes the value two, I will be using it as test. So you can see here, the original data set had a sample of 150 records. The testing has 30 records while the training has 120 observations. So 120 plus 30 will be equal to 150. So we have used 80% to create the training data set and the balance 20% for testing data. Now, the next stage would be to view the training data set that we have created. To view any data set in R, you can type the command view of training. As you can see here, you're familiar with the data set. The only thing which is changing is the sample size of the data set which now has reduced from 150 to 120. So this is the data set which you're already familiar with. So I will not be explaining this again. So at this stage, what do we have? We have done the data inspection. We have created the training data set. We have also created the testing data set. Next thing, let's move on to data visualization. To perform data visualization, we need a package which is called as psych package. Psych package is very useful as it helps us perform visualization. There's a very useful functionality called as pairs.panels, which gives us the pairs plot. Let us look at what it is. In case you have not installed this particular package, the first step would be to run the install.packages command. After this, you can call the library. Once you do this, let us go ahead and run the pairs.panels function. The pairs.panels function, which I'm typing in line number 24, pairs.panel will be run on the training data set. I'm dropping the first variable because that is the ID variable. I'm not interested in the ID variable. The last variable, namely species, which is the sixth variable is also dropped. The first and the sixth variable are dropped. I'm setting the gap as zero. You can further color code the data points for the training data set. Let us go ahead and execute this particular code here. You can see here, our output is ready. Now what I'm gonna do at this stage is, let me zoom this in for better visibility. This is the output of pairs.panel. What are you able to see in this particular graph? You have a four cross four matrix. Along the diagonals, that is from the top left to the bottom right, what you're seeing would be the histogram for each of the scale variables. I can clearly say that none of these variables are normally distributed. 
may it be sepal length, may it be sepal width, may it be petal length or petal width. None of these four variables are normally distributed. Usually PCA works best when the input variables are normally distributed. In the lower triangle, what you see is the scatter plot. Why? At the upper triangle, what you see would be the correlation coefficient value. For example, you are able to see this number 0 0.97. What is 0 0.97? 0 0.97 is the correlation coefficient between petal length and petal width. Since the value is close to plus one, it means that there is a strong positive relationship between petal length and petal width, which means that as the petal length increases, petal width also increases. So this is the highest value. The second highest value is 0.86, which is between the variables petal length and sepal length. So 0 0.86 is again a very, very high number indicating that there is strong positive relationship between sepal length and petal length. Further, to the right side, you can see another number, which is 0 0.82, which is quite high. Again, indicating that there is a strong positive relationship between the variables petal width and sepal length. So there are at least three pairs of variables where there is strong relationship. You can also see some values here, negative 0.14, which means that there's a weak relationship between sepal width and sepal length. Further, there's a negative number for petal length as well as sepal width. So what's the conclusion from this analysis? The conclusion that we can draw is that there are a lot of variables which display strong positive relationship. You may ask me, so what? If there is a strong positive relationship or negative relationship between the variables, it leads to a problem called as multicollinearity. Whenever there is this problem of multicollinearity, when we run some advanced analysis like regression, what we can expect is unstable coefficients, large standard errors, wide confidence intervals. So these are all certain problems that come from the problem of multicollinearity. And when there is the problem of multicollinearity, the best medicine that we can use to solve the problem of multicollinearity is PCA. So this is how the pairs dot panel is very, very useful because it tells us a lot of interesting insights about our data set. Sorry for the disturbance. Let's come back to our studio. Now, we had just now run pairs dot panels. Let's keep this discussion going. After running the pairs dot panel, we are ready to run the PC, PR comp. That is a simple command that we will be running to run the, to execute the principal component analysis. Very simple command, PR comp. So in R studio in line number 29, in line number 29, I'm going to type PR comp. I repeat PR comp. This will be run on the training data set. I'm going to drop the first and the sixth variable. I'm going to normalize this data set by saying scale dot equals true. Let me go ahead and execute principal component analysis. The principal component analysis has run successfully. We have created the object called as PC. Now, if you want to check the attributes in this particular object, what you can do is you can run the command attributes of PC. You can run the command in 34th line. We can run the command attributes of PC. When we run attributes of PC, we can see standard deviation, rotation, center, scale, and X. These are the attributes of the object PC. So there are five different things that we can extract. Standard deviation, rotation, center, scale, and X. Further, if you want to print the results of principal component analysis, you can type the command print of PC. You can see here, this is very, very important. 
along the column, you have the four components. This is PC1, followed by PC2, PC3, and PC4. And along the rows, you have the original variables, namely sepal length, sepal width, petal length, and petal width. Each PC is a normalized linear combination of original variables. When you see here PC, what exactly do we mean by principal component? A principal component is simply a normalized linear combination of original variables. What do we understand by the term rotation? You can see here, R displays the rotation here for a four cross four matrix. What exactly do we mean by rotation? The rotation are nothing but loadings. These are the coefficients of the linear combinations of the continuous variables. As you can see here, each value lies between minus one and plus one. For example, PC1 has a high loading on sepal length, 0 0.51. But its highest loading is on petal length and petal width. Why do I say this? Because in this entire column, the maximum number is 0 0.57 which means that petal length loads heavily on PC1, petal width also loads heavily on PC1. As the petal length and petal width increases, PC1 also increases. You see a negative value here, implying that as the sepal width increases, PC1 will come down. This is because there's a negative relationship or an inverse relationship between sepal width and PC1. Further, when you look at PC2, each of the four values have a negative number, indicating that there is a negative relationship that PC2 shares with all the original variables. The highest negative variable value would be minus 0 0.91. This is the highest loading of this is the highest loading amongst all the four variables. This is between sepal width and PC2. You can clearly see here, sepal width negatively loads onto PC2. What does this mean? As sepal width of a flower increases, PC2 can, PC2 will come down. The same way we can go on to interpret PC3 as well as PC4. While this is useful, there is a very, very interesting technique which is called as the by-plot, which we will be seeing in a few moments from now to visualize the relationships that you are seeing between the original variables and the principal components. Let's go ahead and try to create a by-plot in the next stage. But even before we create the by-plot, let us look at the summary of the principal components. This is very, very important because it tells us which component has how much importance. The first row is standard deviation. Let us please ignore standard deviation. You can see column wise, we have PC1, PC2, PC3, and PC4. I'd like to draw your attention to proportion of variance. This is very important. The first component, namely PC1, has 73% of variance which means the very first component explains maximum variance in the data set to the extent of 74%. I'm rounding off 73.5 to 74. So 74% of the variance in the data set is explained by PC1. Look at PC2. It explains 22% of the variance in the data set. So first component explains 73%. Second component explains 22%, while the third component just explains 3% of the variance in the data set. The last component explains less than 1% in the 1% of the variance in the data set, which means that bulk of the explanation of the variance in the data set is done by the first two components. I repeat, PC1 and PC2 explain bulk of the variance, but when it comes to PC3 and PC4, they are doing they are not doing a good job of explaining a lot of variance. So you can look at the cumulative proportion, which is the third row. It says that the first component explains 73% of the variance. When you take the first and the second component, put together, it explains 95% of the variance in the data set. This is quite good because the first two components themselves are explaining 95%, which means that the remaining 
components merely explain 5% of the variance in the data set. Now, how is this useful? Originally, you had four. Now, from four, we can work with just two variables or two principal components for any advanced analysis. Now, I know that this data set is very small because we are taking only four variables. In a real-time scenario, when you have 60 or 70 variables and you process it using PC or principal component analysis, from 60 variables, you can reduce it to, let's say, five or six variables. Five or six variables are always is always smaller and hence easier to comprehend, easier to visualize, easier to explain as compared to 60 variables. That's how principal component analysis is immensely beneficial because it helps us represent the relationship amongst the variables in the lower dimension, which would otherwise be very, very hard for us to explain in a higher dimension. Let's keep this discussion going. I'll have to plot the variance for each of the components. I'm going to get an error for this particular command. R usually returns an error every time uh, we run this. So let us just adjust the plot margins. Let's just go ahead and adjust the plot margins and rerun the command. You can see here, this is very, very important. As you can see here, let me first zoom in. What you have, let me expand the window. Along the rows, you have the different components. You have component one, component two, component three, and component four. And along the columns, what you have would be the variance. The first component has the highest variance. After that, what you're seeing is basically a drop in the variance for the second component. In the x-axis, you have the four components. And in the y-axis, you have the percentage of variance. The first two components explain the bulk of the variance. But when you look at the third and the fourth, they explain very negligible portion of the variance. And therefore, we can go ahead and ignore the third and the fourth component. We can only look at the first two components. So this is popularly called as the scree plot. A scree plot is very, very useful in studying the percentage of variance that is explained. I repeat, a scree plot is very useful in studying the percentage of variance. What's the next step after this? The next step would be to check for the orthogonality of the components. Orthogonality basically means the independence of the components. So here, I'll be rerunning the pair dot panels. I'll be extracting the individual components. I am not going to run the pairs.panels command on the original variables, but I'm going to run this on the components. Let us go ahead and execute this. You can see here, this will give me the pairs.plot. Let me quickly zoom this in. You can see here, you're already familiar with the scatter plot in the lower triangle. Along the diagonal, you're able to see the principal components. But what you see in the upper triangle, what you see is numbers zero everywhere, indicating that these variables now are uncorrelated. I can't call them as variables. I better use the word principal components. Along the columns, you see the principal components. And for all, for each of these pairs of principal components, what you're seeing is that the correlation is zero. Everywhere you are able to see zero, indicating that these components are orthogonal, meaning the first principal component is independent of the second component. Similarly, it is independent of the third as well as the fourth component. So by extracting the principal components, what we have done is we have removed the problem of multicollinearity. 
Recall that when you ran the pairs.panel command earlier, you had high values of correlation to the extent of 0 0.92, 0 0.86 on and so forth. Now we've been able to solve for the problem of multicollinearity. Let's move on to the next step. What is the next step in the analysis? The next step would be to create a biplot. This helps us visualize the relationship between the variables and the components. So in line number 50, what I'm going to do is uh, run the biplot. So to run the biplot, you need a tool which is called as Dave Tools. You need a tool which is called as Dave Tools. Uh, since I've already installed this particular library, I'm going to just run the library command. You can also call the library of gg biplot. In line number 54, you can see here, I'm going to run the command library of gg biplot. Let's go ahead and execute the command for biplot. In line number 57, I will be executing the command for biplot. We can create the ellipse here. This ellipse will by default capture 68% of the data points. We are also scaling the data set. If you want, you can uh, also add additional layers to this particular graph. You can control the position of the legend. So I'm going to add additional layers to the biplot. Once you do this, the next step would be to simply say print of G. So G is the object which has the biplot. So I can just simply say print of G. So this is the biplot that you are able to see. Now we can also print PC or the results of PC. So here in the console window, you're able to see the PC. Let me maximize the graph window. So this is the result of the biplot. I repeat, this is the result of the biplot. Now it helps to minimize the size of the biplot because we can compare it with the output in the console window. Yes. So along the y-axis, what you have is PC2. And you can see here PC2 explains 22% of the total variability. Along the x-axis, what you have is PC1, which explains 73.5% of the total variance. I repeat, the first component explains 73.5%. The second component explains 22.3% of the variance. Now, this is the zero value. As you move towards the right side, what you see is positive value. As you move towards the left side, what you see would be the negative value. The first three variables, the first three variables, namely petal length, petal width, and sepal length, all of these have a positive value. You can see here, they are to the right side of zero, implying that petal characteristics have a positive loading. You can see the same thing for PC1, the petal characteristics, namely petal length and petal width, both of them have a positive value, which means that they are right at the top. Since the values here are very, very close to each other, that is 0 0.57 and 0 0.56. 0 0.57 and 0 0.56, both of them are close to each other. Further, the one variable, namely sepal width, has a negative value. Now, you can see here, this is to the left side. This is the variable. There's an arrow pointing towards 
the bottom side. This arrow, which is pointing downwards, basically is for the variable sepal width, which has a negative value. Further, when you look at PC2, this is the zero value. Above this would be the positive region, plus one and plus two. And below this is negative one and negative two. Since you see in the bottom half of this particular graph, all the four variables, it implies that all the four variables have a negative relationship with PC2. None of the variables are exceeding zero. That is what you're able to see here as well. When it comes to PC2, all the original variables share a negative relationship. So petal length, petal width, sepal length and sepal width, all of them have a negative relationship. So this is what we can conclude when we look at the biplot. Again, in the x-axis, we have PC1. You can see to the right side, petal length, petal width, and sepal width, sepal length, my apologies. You have petal length, petal width, and sepal length. All of these variables are to the right side of zero. Right side of zero is the positive region, which means that these three variables, petal length, petal width, sepal length, share a positive relationship with PC1. The only variable which has a negative relationship with PC1 or the first principal component is sepal width, which is to the left side of zero. So this is what the visualization tells us. Further, when you look at PC2, the top portion is the positive region. The bottom portion is the negative region. All the four arrows are pointing to the bottom half of the graph, indicating that whether it is petal length or petal width or sepal length or sepal width, all of these four variables share a negative relationship with PC2. But the variable which has the highest negative value with the second component would be sepal width. So this is how a biplot helps us visualize the relationship between the original variables and the components. You can also see here there's an ellipse and this ellipse by default captures 68% of the data points. The red data points correspond to iris setosa, so which means that there is not much of trouble that we have separating setosa flowers. On the other hand, you can see here there are a lot, there's a lot of overlap between the blue as well as the green dots. The blue dots correspond to virginica flowers, while the green dots correspond to versicolor flowers. So it might not be so easy for us to differentiate between versicolor and virginica. Implying, if you run a model, it would be quite easy for you to accurately classify setosa. We are able to see a big gap here. So it is not, it would not be that difficult for us to separate out the setosa flowers. The predictive model would be able to easily separate the setosa flowers, but we might get some misclassification for versicolor and virginica using the two principal components. So this is how uh, a biplot helps us visualize the relationship between the variables and the original data points. Now, what is the next step in the analysis? The next step in the analysis would be to use the principal components to predict in the training data set. So what I'm going to do in line number 72, in line number 72, what I'm going to do is simply to run the predict command. Here I'm predicting with the principal components. I'm going to predict the value for each and every flower. I'm going to run the predict command on the training data set. You can see here, this is the predicted score for each and every flower. You can see here, these are the principal components, the new principal components that we have generated for 120 observations in the training data set. Which can, we can go ahead and use these components as the new variables. We can create a data frame for this particular We can create a data uh, frame using uh, the training data set. We are also going to 
pull out, we are also going to create the species variable. So let me just type view of training. You can see here, these are the principal component scores and the species of the flower is also highlighted. Next, just as we created the principal components for the training data set, we can repeat the same process for the test data set as well. I'm going to run the predict function for the test data set. Let me quickly type view of test. You can see here, these are the principal component scores and the corresponding species of the flowers are highlighted for the 30 entries that we had in the test data set. So this is this is a good uh, this is a good beginning if you want to start off with principal component analysis. We had the original raw data, we processed it. It had multicollinearity problem. We have generated the principal components. The principal components do not suffer from any problem of multicollinearity. They are completely orthogonal. Now, in case you wish to, you can use the principal components as the input variables for any of the supervised learning technique, which is what we will be seeing now, wherein we will be using the principal components as the input variables to predict the species of flower. So since the output variable, namely species, has three different colors, what we are going to do is we are going to run a multinomial logistic regression model. We are going to run the multinomial logistic regression model as part of the second stage of our analysis. So you can see here, multinomial logistic regression model with only the first two pieces. We don't need the four variables. We can run this using only the first two components because the first two components explain 95% of the variance in the data set. I'm just preparing the data. I'm going to convert species as a factor variable, which I'm going to use as a dependent variable, and the principal components will be used as the input variables. Let us go ahead and call the library nnet. So this is the nnet variable. This is the nnet library, which I will be using. The next stage would be to specify the level. I'll be using Setoza as the reference category. Once we use Setoza as the reference category, the next stage, the next step would be to run the multinomial logistic regression model. As you can see here, I'm going to type the command multinomial. Species is the dependent variable. I'm going to use the tilde function and use the first two components as the input variables. The data that I'll be using is the training data set. So as you can see here, in line number 92, I'm going to run the multinomial command. Species is the dependent variable. I'm going to use the first two components of the training data set. The output will be stored in my model. Once you're through with this data set, let me run the summary command. You can see here, this is the output of the summary command. You're getting the coefficients for each of the pieces along with the interceptor. But let's just go ahead and look at the accuracy of this particular model. First, let me just check the accuracy of the training data set. We have built the model. Now we will be checking the accuracy on the training data set. You can use the predict function. The my model is the object that you have created. Now we, are, we will be getting the scores on the training data set and we'll be saving it as an object called as P. In the next stage, what I'll be doing is I will be running the table function to generate a confusion matrix. So table of P comma training dollar species. If you want to visualize the confusion matrix, you can just type tab.
you can see here, this is the confusion matrix that we have. Along the column, you have the actual values and along the row, what you have would be the, would be the predicted values. For example, when you look at, when you look at the output here, let me run this once again. I think this is a lot easier to visualize now. This is the confusion matrix. In the training data set, there are 45 Setosa flowers and all of these Setosa flowers have been correctly predicted. There are no misclassification as far as Setosa flowers are concerned. Now, when you look at the second kind of flower, there are 35 versicolor flowers. In fact, you have 40 versicolor flowers, but they have been misclassified classified as virginica along the column what you have is actual and along the row what you have is predicted so some of the versicolor flowers have been misclassified now when you look at virginica you have 32 flowers which have been correctly predicted as virginica however five flowers have been misclassified as versicolor so there are 32 flowers which have which have been correctly classified. Remember, the diagonal elements represent the correct classification. The off-diagonal elements represent the misclassification. So these five flowers have been misclassified. Similarly here, we see three flowers being misclassified. So what is the overall percentage of error in the model? When we want to calculate the overall percentage of error, we can just simply sum the diagonal elements and sum of each and every element. So when you look at the percentage of error, there is 6% error, which automatically means that the accuracy in the training data set is 94%. I repeat, the accuracy that we have obtained for training is 94%. Now, just as we have done the accuracy and the confusion matrix for training, we can repeat the same process for test data set. In line number 102, we can run the predict function, but this time I will be running this on the test data set. Let me run the table command as before to compare the actuals versus the predicted. So you can see here, this is the test data set. The diagonal elements represent the correct classification the off-diagonal elements represent the misclassification. This is the confusion matrix for the test data set. Let's just look at the overall percentage of error in the test data set. You can see here, there's a 13% error rate, which automatically means that 87% is the accuracy on the test data set. So with this, I have come to the end of today's video. To quickly recap, we looked at what is PCA. We generated the PCA scores. And further, we used the PCA as the input variable to run a multinomial logistic regression model. And when we ran the multinomial logistic regression model on the test data set, we were able to obtain an accuracy of 87%. So I hope you have liked uh, today's video. Thank you very much uh, for watching this particular video. I uh, request you to subscribe to my channel. Also, uh, like and share uh, my videos. Thank you very much. Have a great day.